Here we go. All right. We are starting our live video. A couple minutes late. Thank you all for waiting. Hey, but this is great. People are still popping in. This is wonderful. Great timing. Why I send the five minutes Carlson, early how are you, and then everybody shows up five minutes late. <laughs> In Japan, they say, if you're five minutes early, you're five minutes late, by the way. Um, Steve, yeah, welcome. Welcome, Samson, Pat. Um, if you're here in Zoom, uh, do feel free to turn your video on, show your face um, so we can challenge you. We can ask you to your face, do you even negotiate? <laughs> and you can feel offended like, ah, what are you talking about? Of course I negotiate. Um, so welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about negotiation, uh, how to talk to sellers or really anybody, um, you know, but specifically uh, when you're dealing with, you know, a seller, a motivated seller lead, how should we talk to them? Um, you know, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, how far do we go in terms of negotiating, what's professional, um, and yeah, you know, uh, you know, if you're not negotiating, you're leaving money on the table, bottom line. And that's not something you should be doing um, as a business owner. And if you want to be making more money, then this is probably one of those levers in your business that you need to be leveraging um, to maximize your profit potential per deal. Um, and that's about as much as I know about it. <laughs> um, Keith is the the expert here, and also you know he's learned quite a bit from his mentors who also have taught him a lot. I've heard some of these things, and so I think today's going to be really good. And we look forward to hearing from you as well um, what your experience is with uh, negotiating with sellers. Uh, maybe if you have some questions or a story to share, and and you want some some feedback, you want some counseling on that, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's good to hear from from us, from the group, uh, and maybe we can all help each other in that uh, in that uh, in that capacity. All right. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, if you're here watching the the live stream as well, or if you're watching the replay, uh, you're going to get a lot out of this, I am sure. And feel free to uh, watch it again and take notes because there's probably going to be a bunch of stuff that Keith shares here that <laughs> it's going to be quite valuable, actually. And uh, you'll want to apply it immediately in your business. All right, let's begin. Go ahead, Keith. First, Gerard and Billy, thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much for having your videos on. I'd like to, I just want to build an environment, a culture here in the REI Secrets group, similar to what we've done in REI Automated. In REI Automated, when we show up, we show up. And we show up as our best. We turn our videos on. I'm here. I'm going to honor you with my time, my presence, my attention, my knowledge. And I really don't feel bad requesting that from you. Not only is it more engaging when we're on a Zoom, uh, like what's the best thing? Being in person, right? But since I'm in Florida, Ryan's in Japan, this would be exceedingly expensive to do in person every single week. And Zoom is the next best thing. Relationships are everything, not just in real estate, but in business. And we do business with people that we know, like, and trust. And the first way to build that relationship is by putting a face to the name. And so I would just really encourage you, I, I would appreciate it, if you can, turn on your videos. Um, selfishly, this makes it a lot more entertaining for me. Uh, I, I stare at this screen for about 10 hours a day, and uh, it, it's just a little bit more entertaining when I'm not looking at my old ugly mug here. Um, as per usual with REI secrets, this is not something that I do a lot of like research and planning for or anything. This isn't like a, um, this isn't a pitch. This isn't a presentation. This isn't something that is going to be super formal. Um, this is Steve. I think this is our first time. Have you come to one? Or, I recognize your name, but I don't think that you've come to REI secrets before uh not with my camera on all right wonderful oh that's right maybe that's what it is um and then billy this is i think your first time uh being here so i just kind of wanted to set expectations there's this is no not a presentation this isn't a pitch this is really informal this isn't something this is like in the marine corps we used to call it a hip pocket class it's like hey we have 30 minutes um somebody some sergeant or uh 
above stand up and, and teach these Marines something. We're going to teach our weapon safety. We're going to teach our honor courage, whatever. So that's basically what this is. Um, with that being said, I, I feel like I'm more or less an expert at this. And I think to achieve mastery, um, it can't only be based off of you and your results, but off of also people that you have taught. And I have successfully taught, and I, I would like to show actually, there's two stories that I want to, to um, tell today. And one of them isn't even my story to tell uh, about negotiation and how to properly negotiate. And then I would love to turn this into more or less an open forum, ask me any questions uh, that you want and, and we can really just extract as much value into this. What you put into it is what you're gonna get out. Um, so the first story that I'd like to tell you, I'd like to go back to um, 2019. So I started real estate in 2016. And as with everybody, you learn how to make offers on houses, right? How do you do a quick little desktop analysis? You go to the house, you make them an offer. And in 2019, I joined an apprenticeship and uh, I was taught that offers are nothing short of being sinful. You should not make an offer ever. And this is counterintuitive uh, maybe to everything that you've been taught. You're screaming, no, 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 that's not possible. Well, I'm here to tell you that every house I've ever bought, I've never given an offer. Every house I've ever bought, I've never given an offer. And um, I'd like to, to kind of teach you the sales frame this evening of an offer. And it's going to be really simple. It's going to be really fast. It's going to be really basic because we're going to go over concepts. Here's the concept. Sales frame. If I am coming, Gerard, what is your bride's name? I'm sorry. I should know this. Cheryl. Cheryl. My Cheryl. Brother. That's right. Yeah. Cheryl, I want you to imagine that I come to you and I say, I really, really love those earrings. I would like to make you an offer for those earrings. I just want to make a statement and I want to settle it in. Whoever wants this transaction to happen less comes out as the winner. Whoever wants this, maybe she doesn't want to sell the earrings, right? And so what is she going to say? Well, you know, I'll sell them if, somebody fill in my blank here. I'll sell them if. The price is good enough. If the price is right, that's exactly right. And so whoever wants the deal to happen less ends up winning. Because Cheryl, if you end up, you don't want the deal to happen. Hell no, these are my earrings. Gerard gave me these earrings I was about to say a really big number. 10 years ago, sorry, 10 years ago, I love these short. things. There's no way I would ever sell these earrings. What's gonna happen to me? I'm gonna, my price goes up. No, my price goes up. No, my price goes up. There's no way I would sell for that much. And so I keep on raising my price, raising my price. We've turned this darn near into an auction at this point. And then you walk away, I don't know, $250,000 for your earrings. Just something crazy. Whoever wants the deal less wins. Yeah, Sean, I guess you can I guess you can record to your computer. I've never I've never seen this once in my life. This is also going live in the group. Um, so if you ever if you ever wanted this, I didn't even know that was a thing. Thank you. Yeah, it is. Yeah, you're well. Yeah, you're welcome to record it yourself if you want. Go ahead. Uh, we are live streaming, and that'll be in the group as well. Just if I say something stupid, don't put it on YouTube, okay? It's pretty often. Nice. <laughs> no problem. I'll sign the waiver. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, man. Appreciate All right. So, right, so who whoever wants the deal less is who ends up winning. The sales frame is I am chasing her. What's the price? The earrings are the price. We never want to be chasing the deal. We never want to be chasing the seller because guess what? The house is not the prize. The house, the deal is not the prize. I don't care if you can make money on it. I don't care if that's your business. I don't care if that's your business model. The house is not the prize. You are the prize because here's the thing. The deals that I do, 
the only reason why I do them is because that person has a house and they have a problem. And solving the problem means selling the house. Solving the problem means selling the house. And solving the problem is more important than keeping the house. And only when those two things are true is the seller in the right position. But one other thing must be true. I have to be able to make money. So the seller has a problem. And in order to solve the problem, the house must be sold. And solving the problem is more important than keeping the house. And I must be able to make a monetary gain on the house. Those three rules, right? Is everything conceptually making sense here? So who is the prize? I am the prize. It is not the house that is the prize. If the house is the prize, then I am chasing them and I want the transaction. I want the deal to happen more than they want the deal to happen. I never want to be here. This is why I specifically want to talk to people who are going through divorce, inheritance, pre-foreclosure, health issues, safety issues, and tired landlords. I want you to imagine we're all old enough to know somebody who's gone through a divorce. We're all old enough to know somebody who has inherited a house that had a mortgage and they just can't float it or seen somebody, this is more of a private thing, but seen somebody who's gone through foreclosure or pre foreclosure or health issues, handling cancer treatments. We've all had a loved one go through cancer treatments or seen somebody and just rack up hundreds of thousands of dollars of bills or a safety issue, which would be like a domestic violence issue. Somebody is being physically or mentally abused and they need to leave that situation. Or tired landlord is the last one. This tenant is just wrecking the house and they're not paying. They've been squatting there for five months. I want you to imagine these people just step in their shoes for one moment and realize that the people that I talk to typically aren't just in one of these categories, but they're actually in two of these categories or three of these categories. God forbid they're in four. They will darn near throw the keys at you. If you have a pulse, they will sell the house to you. There's no negotiation, no negotiation needed for some of these people. But sometimes there is. And the reason why I bring this up is because they want nothing more. They've just been dealt a really tough hand in this season of life. Right? Just think about one of those things being present in your life. And then imagine two. And then imagine three. We talk to people all the time. Uh, yesterday, we put a property under contract. There was three of these big five motivating factors in this woman's life. They have been dealt such a tough hand in this season of life. And they want nothing more than to talk to somebody, not freaking AI, not a robot, not a text message. They want to talk to somebody who will hear them and who will help them. And at the end of the day, they have to be right. How they have a problem and they must sell the house to solve the problem. And they must have a desire to solve the problem that is more than their desire to keep the house. And we must, and we, our side must be right. Meaning we have to be able to make money on the deal. When those three things are a match, we are ready for takeoff. We're set to go. We're set to launch, whatever you want to talk about. So when I negotiate, I negotiate heavily, heavily. And I say that not pridefully. I say that um, just like objectively. Most of our houses are between 32 and 46% loan to value. The purchase price is 32 to 46% loan to value. With renovations included, I never have gone above 55% ever on any house I've ever flipped. I've never gone above 55%. I think everybody will agree that I negotiate heavily. Here's the thing. I never gave an offer. So some people will say, Keith, you're taking advantage of somebody. Well, to that, I respond, how can I take advantage when they're the one who gave the price? Are we picking up what I'm putting down? I didn't see any light bulbs that went off there. How can I take advantage of anybody if I did not throw out some dirty, low-balled, disrespectful offer? 
I don't give offers. They gave the price. From there, I'll negotiate. But they are the one who threw out the price. You all have always heard the an age old whoever gives the whoever says the the first number loses. That that really is true. And so it's important that you never give an offer. When we negotiate, it's always a three part negotiation. And I'm prepared, by the way. We deal with people all the time. Ninety, I would venture to say. More than 90% of people, maybe 91, 92, 93. It's going to be somewhere between 90 and 94%, I'm almost positive, of people that we're not going to do business with. We're not going to, we're not going to buy that house. Statistically, it's going to be less than 6%, 6 um, of people that we actually end up buying their house. So when I'm talking to this leads, I realize that there's statistical probability is very low that I'm actually going to end up buying this house. We're not going to be a good fit. Maybe I'm going to refer them to a realtor. Maybe I'm going to refer them to a property management company. Maybe I'm going to refer them to a friend. Maybe I'm going to tell them to just stay in the house, whatever. But most of the time, it's not going to be a good fit. And I genuinely am there to solve that person's problem, to give them advice, not for my own gain. I'll gain if they end up doing business with me. But I will actually push them to do something else if that is what is right for them. I'll put a pin in what I'm about to say. Gerard, yes, sir. Yeah, only 6% of all the leads that you talk to, you end up doing business with? Do I end up buying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you say buying, like actually actually acquiring, taking title of the property, right? Uh, I, I, I use that you term loosely because now we're doing quite a bit of wholesaling okay. this month. And, and so I, right. would still, I would say doing a deal with. Oh, we're, okay. We're going to do a deal with 6% or less of these of these leads. So we'll put under contract a, a pretty decent month month for Crown Properties is 12 to 13. So 12 to 13 leads will come in. We put one under contract. As of right now, we are crushing it this week. I mean, you mean month, per week, really. right? Uh, so like uh, not, 12 to 13 leads per, per, per week and one under contract? Or, no, no, just it, no, take out the week. So for every... 12 lead, 12 to 13 leads that come in. Sometimes oh, okay. those leads will all come in within four days. Sometimes it'll be, you know, 14 days. <clears throat> um, let's see. Last time I checked was admittedly, um, I, think, I think Monday. So a whole week has, has happened. But we are month to date. Twenty five leads came in. Four properties under contract. 25 leads came in, four properties under contract. What is that, one in six? Okay, one in six. Listen, that sounds sexy. Admittedly, I'm not that good all the time. We, here's the thing about averages, they average. And so we'll hit a we'll hit a lucky streak like we are now, but uh, uh, what is it called? Like the human factor of averages? What is it called? Um, regression to the mean? You're going to hit a lucky streak, and then you're going to hit an unlucky streak. Which average is average. We're going to average about 1 in 12. If I were to look at, like, quarter to date, quarter to date, 72 and 6. 6 divided by 72 equals 8%. Well, that's not helpful. Eight out of so. well, one in actually, one in uh twelve, something like that. Yeah, it is. It's about is that, right. Is that about right? Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. One divided by twelve equals yeah, one in twelve. Great. Quarter to date, one in twelve leads that come in. We put under contract. Um, we just hit a lucky streak this this month. Has been a good month for us. Um, that said. That said. Do you uh, see? <laughs> Yeah, go ahead. Bill. Do you see those like numbers fluctuate and stuff as you like take on more onboards and things like that? And how does that uh, like affect with like expanding and streamlining? Do you see any kind of correlating values with that? You mean onboards like onboarding new people into my business? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Because when you bring okay. somebody in, they're going to suck and they're going to yeah. waste your ad budget and it's going to be terrible. 
Um, mm -hmm. With PPC, which is, I only do uh, inbound leads specifically from Google Ads, either in the form of okay. PPC or PPL, so pay-per-click or pay-per-lead. Um, like really bad averages is one in 20. And so if you have 20 leads coming in, like somebody's going to get yelled at. And if we go one more week, you're <laughs> fired type of bad, I'm wasting money. Or again, average is average. Like they're going to get two properties under contract back to back like that. And it's going to lower the average. Back -back. Okay. Yeah. Just sense. in the, in the beginning, I give our people six weeks, roughly 45 days um, to, yes. to hit like bare basic KPIs. Mm -hmm. And we have a, we have a ramp rubric for all of our, for all of our salesmen, both the lead managers and acquisition managers, it starts at 45. Well, truth be told, we begin grading at the 30 day mark because the first 30 days you're just lost in the sauce. Like, as you know, you're drinking from a fire yeah. hose. There's so much information. Mm -hmm. So from the mm -hmm. first 30 days, it's like, they're, they're just like unlearning a lot of bad habits, frankly. And, mm -hmm. um, we'll begin tracking them at the 30 day mark. We give them 40 or, well, you know, two weeks at the 45 day mark. That's when we actually count their numbers. And then there's benchmarks at day 60, day 75 mm -hmm. and day 90. Each it one is. of those has a benchmark that you must hit. Otherwise, <laughs> immediate termination. There's no grace okay. that's given. And with REI, yeah, it's yeah, basically it built into the system where you can uh, just like look at those metrics pretty easily. Is that correct? Red, yellow, green. That's right. If it's yeah. red, okay, you're, awesome. okay. you're about to get fired. <laughs> that really helps. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Yeah, you can share that. Um in a bit, Keith, though, like, why don't it would be good to share what the KPI tracker yeah, looks like so I, we can I see, see that. A, so I'll just uh, yeah. put a pin in what I was about to um, say. And, and this is what it looks like. So you can see like my, my personal numbers. And again, everything is going to fluctuate. And so, gosh, where is, um, I thought we had ad spend right here. Did we, did we do a change, Ryan, recently? I always have ad no. spend. No, uh, it should. There's always. I a, didn't I change know. anything. Something is up. Huh. Uh, but typically, you know, it I, could be in financials. I, uh, it, it definitely will be in financials. But as but you, you don't want to show that, yeah. Um, I, I have a very, very low budget. Why? Because we're very efficient. We're very effective. My team is really, really good at what they're doing. Um, as you can see, let's compare apples to apples. Oh my goodness. I just wasn't scrolled to the left, Ryan. Nothing is wrong. I wasn't scrolled all the way to the left. You can see <laughs> how much we've spent here. There you go. <clears throat> and so you can see like our cost per lead over the last uh, month to date, roughly three weeks is actually better than it has been quarter to date over the last roughly 75 days. But like, there's really no reason to complain. We were trending high and now it's getting better and the cheaper it gets the better it is for me, cost per lead, as long as the quality doesn't go down. So our lead connection rate, we're staying really consistent, 88 to 89%. The triage call is staying really consistent. This is really bad. Miss K has attended two, Miss K is our lead manager. She's attended two funerals in the last 30 days, unfortunately. So she's taken almost two full weeks off. Our acquisition manager was filling in for her. He did a really good job, but it's not his normal job and his speed to lead kind of suffered. Anyway, that's the reason for this, which is terrible. Um, so, but just know that nobody's going to get fired. But Billy, this would be an example of like, you're on the chopping block. If I see something red like this, okay. somebody is screwed up. And then yeah. qualified uh -oh. triage calls, qualified triage <laughs> calls. This is really where we get like, are our leads qualified? I genuinely don't care how cheap they are. What I'm going to look at is cost per qualified call or cost per qualified lead rather than no. cost per lead. So this qualified triage calls really makes a big difference. So basically 60 to 70% of all of the leads that we generate are qualified. I approved hundred percent of them. All of them went almost all of them. One of them dropped off here in the deal analysis. And then we've just done a tremendous job with perfect presentations. As you can see here, six out of seven of them were pitched and four out of six of them were put under contract. And I think we're about a hundred thousand dollars um, projected Amazing. off those four deals. So that, this is our KPI tracker. And we really do go off these metrics. The short of the shirt is just look at the colors. If there's anything red, look at that. Like that's, that's the problem. That's the biggest constraint. If you have multiple reds, then look at the one that's furthest to the left. Okay. Look at the one that's furthest to the left. The reason why I say that is because it's like, it's a funnel turned on its side, 
right? So I spent 1100, I generated 25 leads. Of those 25 leads, we connected with 22 of them. Of the 22 that we connected with, we triaged 12 of them. Of the 12, we qualified seven. So see how it's a funnel right here? And so if you have yeah, two absolutely. of them that are red, it would be foolish to focus on this one because it's gonna affect less cards, less KPIs down here on the funnel. You should focus on this one and almost by proxy, this one will be solved. Because if, yeah. you, if you solve this one, then everything to the right of this one gets better. Okay. That's the reason why I say that makes a lot of sense. focus on the left red, then focus on any red, then focus on the left yellow, then focus on any yellow. If they're all green, oh my goodness. <laughs> Celebrate. Yeah. Think, think about the numbers that we have in Go. our business. If these were all green, um, I don't know. I probably wouldn't be talking to y'all tonight and I'd be taking my wife out for dinner. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. I see that there is a bunch of stuff in the chat. But, I but we... Yeah, that's fine. Um, so let's go back to what we were talking about there, because you were you made the comment, Keith, that you know um, you really only do deals with maybe six to maybe about six percent, eight percent of all the leads that come in. Yeah, and that, I, I if I understand correctly, the reason is is that when when you're talking to them, when you're triaging them, you discover that this person is not qualified for, for my in the way that yeah, for yeah, someone exactly. i want to do a deal with they're not one qualified those, so i'm not even going to go things, into the negotiation like that's exactly right that's exactly right. One of those <laughs> so before you start that. yeah yeah so before you even start negotiating with the seller you need to qualify is this person worth my time to negotiate with um and then we go from there that then we start the negotiations which which is you know well what do you need from this deal how much yep. what's your number yep. Yep. <laughs> um and that's we call that the walk away uh yeah so let's go from there a little bit more and then okay. i think if we have more questions um we'll, we'll field those as they come i um i'm trying to remember when gerard asked me a question i said i'm going to put a pin in my thought process i don't remember where the pin is so we're just going to jump off the <laughs> and build the plane on the way down Yes. <laughs> um, all right. So let's just go where, where Ryan was talking about. Yeah. When you're talking to somebody, I can get a pretty good feel within the first, I would say five minutes. I, I would, it would shock me. And how do you do that? Like what's, what are, what's like one of the ways where you're like, Oh, I hate the word that I'm about to use. Um, uh oh, I hate the word that I'm about to use, but it's going to be compliance. Yeah. When I ask you a question, do you comply or do you argue? Give me the information that I need. Again, I am the prize. And if you want me to help you, if you want me to buy your house, if you want me to solve your problem, <laughs> help me help you type of situation, please answer the question. Don't give me unnecessary stuff. Don't try to, when I ask you, so is there a mortgage that we'll need to take care of? Or is it free and clear? Don't give me any freaking pushback. I'm asking for a reason. How quickly do you need to sell the house? Well, I don't need to sell the house. Okay, give me an attitude again, see what happens. <laughs> I don't like hearing these things and, and really it happens super, super fast in a call. And I hate, truly, I, I do not comply. I, it's the reason why I don't, but it's the reason why I don't live in Hawaii anymore because I refuse to wear a freaking face mask. I hate the freaking politics. I don't like complying. I got bossed around enough in the Marine Corps. Thank you very much. I am my own man. And but with that being said, when I need help, when I'm going to my doctor, I'm not going to question what freaking questions he asks me. When I, I just had massive reconstructive surgery and he asked a lot of questions. I really needed this surgery. Otherwise, 90% of my pectoral muscle is not going to be attached to my shoulder for the rest of my life. And I won't be able to do this anymore. Right. Why are you asking me that? Yeah, yeah. What do you mean? Because I'm going to open you up and, and place a cadaver tendon in there. I need to make sure they don't have hepatitis B or whatever, you know? It, yeah. You could call it, call it like you in, in a lawyer speak, where it's like it's a hostile witness, right? I mean, they're, <laughs> yeah. they're uh, essentially, yes. um, they're hostile. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, if that's the way that they're going to react, well, how do you deal with that? Do you, I, what do you do then? Do you shut the conversation down? Well, well it's nice talking to you. You have a great day. You know, good I luck will. with the realtor. Actually, let me get there. There's one more thing yeah. that I want to say, and okay. then I'll get straight to that. So, so we call it a, a triage call. 
the reason why we call it a triage call is because I want you to think about a triage nurse in the emergency room. And I want you to think about somebody who comes in and they say, I have a headache. That's it. I have a headache. Do you send them to the surgeon? Or do you give them ibuprofen? Oh, well, actually, y'all, I don't trust the two of you who just shook your head. This person has a headache. They could be bleeding in their brain and have a brain aneurysm about to keel over dead. We don't know why they have a headache. They could have just got their a horse kicked them in the face and their, their brain's about to explode. Like something horrible could be happening. So just because somebody says, I have a headache, we don't know enough information on whether or not we need to give this person 800 milligrams of ibuprofen and tell them to change their socks and walk it off and, and put their big boy pants on. Or if we're going to tell this person, you need to get back, we're prepping OR right now. We don't have enough information. And it is our job. It is the triage nurse's job to find out what is happening. Can you tell me why you have a headache? Is there any circumstances that happened prior to you entering in my doors that would indicate what what my what my uh, what's it called when you're reacting? What my reaction to this needs to be? And so that's the reason why it's called a triage call because the triage call is done by the lead manager. The lead manager is a gatekeeper to the acquisition manager, and the acquisition yeah. manager is who in this scenario? Who is the acquisition? The, they are the brain doctor, doctor. The, they surgeon. Are, they are the surgeon. <laughs> yeah. Do we just let yeah. people walk back to the surgeon and say, I need you to cut a four inch incision right here. I have too much pressure inside my brain. No, we do not allow people to self-diagnose and just walk in and have surgeries <laughs> like this, right? The triage nurse, that's their job. And so that's our job. When we talk to a lead, it's our job. And part of that job is the negotiation. So we're, um, you know, I said I only had one thing to say before I get to your point, Brandon, or Ryan. I've been talking to Brandon all day today. Um, <laughs> before we get into like a non-compliant person who's giving us a little bit of yeah, yep. resistance or something like that. You want to go into a compliant person, a normal person who's not arguing with you? I was, <laughs> I was going to go into this and I forgot what I was going to say when I called you Brandon. I don't know. I felt bad. Um, <laughs> That's fine. I have oh, another oh, question I though. Oh, okay. No, All right. You're not allowed. <laughs> 6% or less. Why is it 6%? Well, I'm yeah. contracting, what do we say? 8%? 8 mm -hmm. to 12, yep. 8 to 12%. Yeah. Yep. Or whatever 12, it is. Yeah. Like about 12%. Yeah. But here's the thing. You're not, going to close, you're not going to do a deal on every property that you put under contract. The buyer's yep. going to back out. The seller's going to buy the back out. You're going to back out because ARV was wrong. The repairs were wrong. The seller lied to you. Um, there's going to be an issue with title. There's a lien that you didn't know about. Person doesn't even own the house. Uh, there's going to be issues that come up and you're not going to close on hundred percent of your, your deals. And so as a noob, like a super, super new person, you're going to close on roughly 40%. And I have enough data to prove this. I feel very confident in saying these numbers. Within ARIA Automated, we track this up. If you're very, very new and very, very bad, you are going to close 40%, meaning 60% of your deals are going to fall through. Not deals, but contracts are going to fall through. You're not going to monetize those contracts. If you're doing an exceptional job, you are going to keep 80% and therefore 20% is lost 20% attrition. So 40 to 80%. Um, my company has actually been on both sides. Right now, we're at 80. This time last year, we were at 40. Now, Keith, you said if you're really new and you really suck, you're at 40. Okay, yes, as a generalization, if you're really new and you really suck, it's going to be at 40. Or if you negotiate too heavy and sellers get seller's remorse, and they try to go behind your back and sell it to somebody else for $10,000 more. This is what happened to us time and time and time and time and time again last year and the year previously. So I was stuck down here in the high 40s, low 50s. Now we're doing a fantastic job. I'd venture to say all four properties that we put under contract this month. We're selling one of them on the 26th. We're selling one of them on the 1st. We're selling one of them on the 3rd. And we're selling one of them on the sixth. 
Like we already have buyers lined up. EMD has been submitted to the title company. Title is clear. We're going to close on these deals. I think all four of them. Really hope you. <laughs> um, okay, so that's the reason why I say 6% or less is because yeah, we're contracting 8% or 9% or 10%, but not all of those contracts are actually gonna make it to hitting your bank account. Okay, now let's get into a non-compliant person. And so this is just somebody who is providing a little bit of resistance. And so we've taken them through the triage call and we've asked them, so can you tell me a little bit about the house and, you know, kind of just what you have going on with it? We asked them, so what repairs or updates are needed on the house? We, we understand the condition that it's in. We asked them, how quickly do you need to sell this house? Now we understand what their time frame is. We asked them, is there a mortgage? We know what that is. Again, we're going to separate the mortgage away from the purchase price. This is a big thing from anybody who doesn't, isn't in this ecosystem here. We're going to separate the mortgage from their asking price. Why are we going to do that? Because we need to know, well, no, it's twofold. We need to know how much they need cash at close. I'm going to guarantee your check at closing. How in the world can I do that if I don't know how much you owe in your mortgage? In order to get you this, I must know what this Let's is. Know what also, this is. also, when we separate the mortgage from the purchase price or the asking price, now we line ourselves up for a creative finance close. Now we can take this mortgage subject to when we buy the house. Also, when we hear, all right, 160 is on the mortgage and you're looking for $40,000 to walk away with, well, 160 plus 40 is $200,000. And let's say that doesn't work. So this $40,000 now needs to be separated between some money now at close and some money later after close. So it's going to be subject to and owner financing. But again, we would not be able to do this had we not known the mortgage amount. Then we get into the asking price. This is where people become fairly uncompliant. Like after thousands of calls that I have done myself personally, and after even more thousands of calls that our team has had and I have reviewed. This is where people kind of cop an attitude. So how much are you hoping to walk away with? This is after we take care of the mortgage, after we handle all the seller expenses, the transfer tax, the roof certificate, there's nothing that you have to do. We're gonna buy the house just as it sits right now. How much are you hoping to walk away with? This is going to be like your check. You get to keep, you get to cash in your bank. As you walk from the closing table, how much do you need to walk away with? Well, Keith, your website said that you would give me a fair, fast cash offer. How would you all respond to that? Somebody who's not an active REI automated client. Just I would just say, like, I mean, I'm just joined, so. Um, yeah, but you, you can't. You're, you're, you go ahead. Go ahead. You, that's fine. <laughs> okay. Um, I would definitely say that it's, um, you know, that you are letting them choose what is fair for them. So having that conversation is what you're opening up to. I like so. that. The fact that you, I mean, I don't know how much the training. So Billy is like our newest client. Mm -hmm. like they, yeah. She has definitely not gotten to this part in the training. I guarantee. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> just so seemed like I, I appreciate that you've picked up on this so quickly. That's you hit the intent. I wouldn't say it like yeah. that, but you absolutely nailed the intent. And so there's different ways that you can say this, you know, different strokes for different folks. Um, John's wife had asked me last week and I was like, I hate this question. This is the, I just want to throttle you through the phone and be like, you want me to give you an offer on your house that I've never seen and just, just hope that things go well. I, I've, you could be straight up, the house could be burnt down. <laughs> For all I know, you could be absolutely lying. I know nothing about the house. You ever, you ever bought a car that you've never test driven? Yeah, that's like a $20,000 decision. We're talking about a $200,000 decision, but you want me to just, just make a commitment that I would buy your house? You're dumb. You're dumb. You cannot actually tell me that you think that you're going to get a quality offer. Like I have to build in so many contingencies. Worst case scenario. Like what if there's no kitchen? 
What if you've ripped out all the floors, there's holes in the wall, some jerk stripped all your copper pipes, and there was a there was a fire in the kitchen and ruined all the HVAC and all the ducting. And there's black mold in the bathroom. And, and the dog chewed the doorway. Like, how far do you want me to take this? I can build in all these contingencies. Let's just start at $10 and we'll go up from there. You cannot get a quality off right now, okay? I've never even seen your house. We've been talking for five minutes. So this is what I say. Billy, if somebody ever says, I, I just need you to give me an offer. Keith, on your website, it said that you give me an offer. Okay, well, Miss Billy, I would absolutely love to give you an offer, but here's the thing. I think that as a real estate investor, I'm a very professional person, okay? I'm just as professional as any doctor or any attorney that's out there. I want you to think about going to your doctor. Your doctor is not going to give out any recommendation without knowing all the facts and the figures about your condition, right? Same thing with an attorney. Now, you need to understand, Miss Billy, I'm not your typical real estate investor that's here to give you some lowball, dirty, disrespectful offer. I'm not here to make as much money as I can. I'm not here to get rich off of you. I genuinely want to solve your problem. I like to work with people. I like to give them what they need. And that's the reason why I'm asking you, how much are you hoping to walk away with? Keith, by God, your website says in big red bold ink, uh, you would give me an offer. You know? In all of my years of doing this, which by the way, Billy, I've been doing this eight and a half years. I've talked to more than 8,000 sellers. Pretty impressive. <laughs> I've, just, I've just come to realize that these investors that are out here making dirty lowball offers, it's just really disrespectful. They really shouldn't do that. And the reason why they shouldn't do that is because they don't know your situation. They don't know anything about you other than what you've, told me over a 15 minute phone call. You know your situation better than anybody. How disrespectful is it? Give you an offer. Here's another thing that I've learned. People that really wanna sell, they've already run the numbers. They know how much their bottom line is. They know how much they need to walk away with. Mm -hmm. So just be straight with them. Okay. Candid question requires a candid answer. What is the absolute bottom dollar you could take for your property. Wonderful. Yeah, that makes it a lot easier, you know, than actually like presenting something, you know, and then just having them, you know, say no, and then, you know, just continuing to throw numbers out there, you know, mm -hmm. kind of just puts the ball in their court and then you can work with it from there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And awesome. then here's the thing. Um, like I said, I've, I've literally done this thousands of times. I really wasn't lying. Uh, a lot of times I'll be on the phone with a spouse and like, I would actually say, if I was talking to you, I'd be saying Miss Billy, just like I was in that little fictitious role play there. And then, you know, what always happens when every time I swear, every time I'm talking to a couple, that's when the husband comes up. Keith, I tell you what, your website said, I'm going to hold you to it. Man to man, bro. Man to man. <laughs> Look, Steve. My partner is an investor. If I go tell him that you want us to make an offer, by golly, we will. I've, I've done it before. You know what he's going to tell me? He's going to say, Keith, just start at five bucks and we'll go up from there. Tell me, Steve, do you really want me to come back with some stupid offer? And then you can just tell me what you really want. Do you want me to waste that time? Or do you want to just bypass this whole stupid game and you tell me what you actually need? I'll tell you, in all seriousness, two people have never given me personally a number. Two, everyone has always broken. I could do this all day. They don't like those three. I've got seven more where that came from. We will just keep on going. I'll throw it back in your face, throw it back in your face, throw it back in your face. I will break you. There's two, and they were both men. Two men that would not give me an answer. 
And so at the end of the day, Ryan, going going to your point, going to your point, I get hmm, I get mouthy with people. I have a little bit of an attitude. It's a little bit immature. Um, <laughs> but it, but it sounds something like this. I don't even have it written in the script because you really shouldn't say this. Uh, you should you should kind of so don't do this. Yeah. Come up come up with your version of this. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this is what I say. I get really accusational. Like we play really petty. At this point, we've gone back and forth for probably 15, 20, even 25 minutes dragging this on. And and it's fun for me. Like honestly, it's like, oh, okay. This person, this person's a damn used car salesman. I can tell this dude knows not to give a number. This guy got it beat into him with a stick. Don't give a number. All right, we'll we'll play. We'll see who who's actually better at this mental warfare because I won't get disrespectful. I will not get unprofessional. I won't call you names. But I will play petty at the very end and get accusational. And I'll say, I won't actually say this to them. I will tell a story. I love teaching in parables, just as Jesus did. The best storyteller on earth taught in parables. I believe that we should as well. So I'll say, you know, Ryan, and I'll kind of bring up like how many people I've talked to and, and how many years I've been doing this. And, or sometimes I don't even, I don't even say, it. I've been doing this a long time. I've, I've had the pleasure and the blessing of talking to a lot of people, buying a, you know, a house or two here and there. And I've just, I've just really learned there's this guy that I was talking to like a month ago. God, what a tire kicker. This guy could not make up his mind. He just could not make a decision. Would not tell me what he needed to walk away with. You know what ended up happening? I ended up just getting off the phone with him. I followed up about a week later. He lost his house to the bank. This is a true story, by the way. It wasn't one, one month ago and one week later. It was years ago. But I'll tell this story. And, I'll, and I really did follow up with him. And he really did lose his house to the bank. You know what sucked about that? I could have bought his house. I could have helped him. I could have got him some cash to walk away with. But now he has his credit ruined for the next seven to 10 years. And more likely than not, that bank is going to attach what's called a deficiency judgment to his name. And he's going to have to claim that as taxable income and therefore raise his taxable liability and pay money, pay taxes on that as if it was actual earned income. Now, I do not want this to happen to you. I don't know if this is exactly your situation. Ryan, I don't know if this is true, but you're kind of sounding like Mike, who was just the biggest tire kicker I've ever talked to in my life. Do you want to do a deal? Do you want to get a deal done? Because if not, it sounds like you're not very serious. You haven't run your numbers. And that's okay. It's okay to do that. I want to help you. I just can't help you now. So this is what I encourage you to do. And at any point in time, this is the real pace that I would say this. At any point in time, they can interrupt me. They can push back. I'm not a tire kicker. <laughs> Give me your number then, right? I'm hoping. I'm kind of, I don't want to say baiting. That sounds terrible. But I am, what's a, what's a positive version of this? I'm awaiting him. I am inviting him to, to interrupt me and continue this conversation. But if he doesn't, I'm going to allow these natural pauses. And if he doesn't interrupt me, I'm eventually going to say this. And so what I'd like you to do is take a moment, run your finances with your spouse. And if you're really serious about, about getting this thing sold, run those numbers, come up with a number that you need to walk away with and give me a call. And if not, no harm, no foul. I have zero expectations. I just love the opportunity to help you if I can. With that being said, do you have any final questions for me while you have me on the phone? And if not, all right, hope you have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you soon. I get off the phone with them.
two people, the two people that I was unable to break did not let me get through any of my accusation of calling them a tire kicker that is incapable of making a decision. They hung up prior to that. Every person that I have gone into the accusation of a tire kicker that they're incapable of, I tell the parable of Mike or whatever. Um, it's worked every time, they, especially with men. I can make a decision. You don't have to challenge me. I'll make a decision right here, right, right now. You just watch. And then they'll give me a number, right? And so it's <laughs> important though. It's important to have a little bit of a process of, not a little bit. This is a very good process that we've refined um, over a lot of trial and error. We, we have developed a process of negotiating. And this is how we handle people who are, uh, what's the word, non-compliant. Like they're not really working with us. There's a lot of resistance. There's a lot of, no, we're going to do this by my rules. Here's the thing. Your house isn't the prize, my friend. I am the prize. And if you want me as the prize, you have to jump through my hoops. He who has the gold Oopsie. makes the rule. He who has the gold makes the rule. I'm the one with the gold. I'm the one with the money to buy your house. If you want me to buy your house, play by my rules. It's very, very simple. When they break, because <laughs> you're going to get so many people who say, I was hoping that you would make me an offer. When they give you a number, you should always, the magic number is three. You should always ask three times. Let's say they say, Keith, I need $40,000. Okay. Take two breaths. They say $40,000. Two breaths. Natural rest between <laughs> pause between each of these breaths. We are going to... I, so again, Marine Corps, I went to a lot of funerals and they would always say where a lot of like 9-11 memorial tributes or Veterans Day, you always observe a moment of silence. Every birthday ball that we had uh, in the Marine Corps, birthday ball is just a, a dance, um, like a formal dance. In the back of the, the room, there's always a table draped in black utensils and stuff that's upside down in honor of the people, who, the Marines who have passed before us, uh, prisoner of war is missing in action, that sort of thing. And so we'll always stand up and we'll observe a moment of silence. And so when I realized I can observe a moment of silence for the death of this number, and it was actually really, 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 really effective, that's, it was really easy. I'm used to observing moments of silence. I can sit here at parade rest for a very long time. And so they'll tell me $40,000, watch me. $40,000. Hmm. Hmm. John, I am buying this house, you know, as is. There's, there's no warranties. There's no there's no repairs or updates that you have to do on the house. I'm buying it just the way it sits. So is that the lowest you would go? These are like real, this is the timing is everything. Think about a joke. Think about a joke. If you just rush the joke, what a stupid comedian. You have to play the pause, right? Timing is almost as important as the words that you say. And I don't, I don't want to say that you're acting. You're not acting. This isn't theatrical. But there is some form of timing has to be right for this to make sense. Did you all feel awkward when I was doing that? Just a little bit? Did I kind of put you at ease? Like, what the heck, Keith? Like, get to the oh, yeah. point. It Hurry up. Definitely feels awkward. This is weird. Yeah. yeah. We want that. <laughs> We want a little bit of this emotional roller coaster of uneasiness. Yeah, they feel uncomfortable, and the, and then they want to fill that empty space. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> their opportunity, space. Their, it's their opportunity to talk, and what are they going to do? They're going to yes. respond to the yes. comment, which is they're going to say, 
either the that's same number the or right. low, lower. We're gonna we're gonna go. So rule of three. I'm gonna teach you the rule of three, and then I'm gonna teach you the the rule of repeating. Um. So that was number one. That was my first price reduction question, guys. But I'll tell you the story in a little bit. This this is gonna be the best money that you. This is the best skill. This is the highest dollar value minutes of your entire life. I promise you, this is the highest paying dollar per minute you will ever get paid in your life is learning how to execute this approximately three minutes of renegotiation. I promise you, I have unequivocal proof to the tunes of millions of dollars of reductions millions of dollars turning non-deals they want too much for their house there's no way i would ever buy their house because i would lose money to they reduced so substantially that i couldn't say no remember i want the deal less than them 100 percent of the time i want to do the deal less than they want to do the deal i can't say no it's such a good deal i cannot say no so remember i said is that the, the least that you would take and he, they're going to talk, they're going to talk. It was really uncomfortable. I kind of want to like rinse myself of the uncomfortability. They always like to kind of rant a little bit. And then they're going to, I don't know. I just like to get to the point. So I'll often interrupt people. Billy, do you have a number? What is the least amount? Remember, I, I, asked, you, I asked you a question. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Keith, I don't know. We could, we could probably take, we could probably take 30,000. What do you do? Observe a moment of silence for the death of that walkaway number. Maybe not two breaths this time, maybe just one. It needs to be natural for you. But then I would say, well, you know, Billy, I, I am paying all of the closing costs. There's literally no money that's coming out of your pocket. This is your check guaranteed at closing. This is the amount. No closing costs whatsoever. I'm taking care of that. Is that the least you'll take? Hubba 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 hubba. Twenty five thousand dollars. I've now asked two times. Now we're at twenty five thousand dollars. I'm gonna observe a moment of silence. Also, oh, this is really big. I don't know if you guys can you hear me sighing just now. <laughs> yeah. Some people are saying no. When I actually do negotiation, I always use this microphone. And honest to God, like this sort of stuff works. This intimacy, freaking, I cannot find the hole. Um, this level of intimacy will change this. This sounds a lot different when I talk, yes? And so when I go. You all know what I'm doing, even though we would only have the audio, right? And I would say, John, you can't do just a little bit better than that. Keith, the lowest I could go is $20,000. I want you to imagine they are right in front of you. You know how when people are like awesome to talk to on the phone, you can literally hear them smiling. I want the opposite. <laughs> I want them to feel you resting your head on your hand. I want you to make them feel you furrowing your brow. I want you to feel, I want you to have them feel your sigh of disgust. And then I'm going to tell you a story. Even when it's not disgusting, you have to sigh a sigh of disgust. Before I tell the story, here's the law of repeating numbers. You're always, this is a fireable offense in my company. Number one, you will not give an, an offer. We will not give a number. If you give a number, you are automatically fired. There is no grace. There is no freaking nothing. You will never, ever, ever give a number. You give a number, you can see your way out. Number two, 
you always ask three times unless you hit the law of repeating numbers, which simply is how much do you need to walk away with? $40,000. Okay, well, I am buying it as is. There's no warranties. There's no repairs or updates that you have to do. It's at the lowest you would go. I could come down to 30000 30000 Is that the least that you would take? Yeah, Keith, $30,000 is the least that I would take. That's a repeating number. They said 40, then they said 30, then they said 30. Do not ask for a price reduction after you've hit a law of repeating numbers. This is just like your child asking you why when you've already told them to do something twice. It's disrespectful. You are, you are now going to hurt your rapport with the seller. You are now beating them up over price. You are now caring more about profits than you are people. If the numbers don't work, we don't try to fit a square peg into a round hole. If the numbers don't work, we don't chase. We simply don't do the deal and we're on to the next. So when you ever hit a repeating number, you stop. I don't care if it's on the first time you ask. So if they say $40,000, well, I'm buying it as is, yada, 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 yada. Is that the least you would take? Yes, $40,000 is the least that I would take. I'm done negotiating. I promise you, if you if you try to negotiate further, you will ruin rapport and you will not get a contract. And if you get a contract, I swear to you, you will not close that contract. Why? Because they know that you're money hungry. You don't give a rat's ass about them or helping them. And it is all about your bottom dollar. They will not close on that contract. Negotiating properly is the most impactful thing that you can learn how to do in your business. I'd like to tell you a story. 2019 is when I learned really, really, really well how to not give an offer. And this was the last in-person house I ever bought. Everything since then, 2020 on, was all virtual. It was all done over the phone. But I was learning this stuff and I was really excited. This lady asked to meet me at a, um, at a sushi restaurant downtown. She had originally called and told me that she had this condo for sale and she wanted, I think she said that she wanted $400,000 for it. I forget the original number, but it was really bad. It was way too much. She was wanting more than full retail and there was so much work that needed that was needed on this house. And and basically I said, this is not even something I would entertain. Um, go freaking pull your head out of you know where when you get your life figured out, come back to me and we can actually talk some real numbers if that's of interest to you. About an hour later or so, um, she called back and the number had come down to 300,000, I believe. We went from 400,000 to 300,000. 300,000 was like a fairly okay deal. No, you know what? I think it was 350,000. It was 400 to 350,000. And I said, wow, one hour. I didn't have to do anything. Um, we just got a, a $50,000 price reduction. This tells me that there is some inherent motivation. If somebody can... It's a, John, that's not a question. So I'm going to read it in a little bit <laughs> and then I'll get to it. Um, so she had come down a lot of money in a short period of time. I didn't have to do anything except not display any interest at that price. But I, I could see that there was some inherent motivation. I didn't really know what it was. And so I agreed to meet her at the sushi restaurant um, downtown. $350,000 was the price. And I pulled all my comps. I said, I'll meet you at this place. I think I gave myself like an hour, 30 minutes to prep and 30 minutes to drive. And I told my wife, "Go." this was back in the day when I was super young. I didn't have a beard. Um, I literally was like two years old. Uh, and nobody was going to believe that I was going to buy this house for any amount of money. And so I would, I would wear a suit to all of our, all of our in-person dealings. And so I told my wife, go iron my suit. I have to leave in 30 minutes. And I hopped on 
uh, the MLS or prop stream or whatever. I pulled, pulled these comps. I knew my numbers, analyzed my deal, printed off some uh, paperwork for me, and then printed off some paperwork for the seller. Um, pretty sure I even printed off my script just so I could peek at it underneath the table. And uh, literally, I'm, I'm really pretty confident that I did do that. And so we, we went out, I met her, I look all nice in this suit. We're having a great, like normal conversation. And I say, Hey, Sandra is her name. Wow. I can't believe I remember that. Sandra is her name. And I say, Sandra, let's get down to business. We're talking about your house. I don't mean to waste your time, but, but even at $350,000, I'm not going to make a dime. I would, I would basically be, be, be doing all of this work and walking away with nothing. Like my break even is that number or really, really close. It was very, very close to 350. I'm doing the numbers in my head and that's accurate. So I know that it was 400 and then she came down to 350. I'm doing the numbers. She couldn't believe it. And I said, look, here's the comps. And I gave her all the stuff that I had printed off. Here's this condo. Here's this condo. Here's this condo. These are in the same building. Oh, before that though, I said, what do you think the value of the house is going to be after it's fixed up the condo? She was quoting things in like 650, 700. And I said, where, tell me the addresses. She told me the addresses and they're not even in the same building. Those had better amenities and they had an ocean view. This one had less amenities and it didn't have an ocean view. Big price drop, right? So I, I showed her, these are the comps that are in your building that have sold for this amount, this amount, and this amount. I'd like to just take the average. And this is the amount that, that I'm going to be able to sell your house for. <clears throat> now let's talk about what it's going to take how much it's gonna cost both effort, time, and money to take your property from the condition that it's at to full retail value. And I broke down those costs. Here's how much the realtor is gonna be. Here's how much my closing cost is gonna be. I'm gonna to have to hold on to you know, mortgage. I have principal and interest and taxes and insurance. I'm gonna to have to pay the condo association dues. I'm gonna to have to pay for the trash and the utilities, all this stuff, right? Cost money. For how long is it gonna take me to fix this thing up? Probably six months from day one to, to when I sell it. How much is that gonna cost? This much. Then I'm gonna have all my renovations. My renovation is gonna cost me $40,000, whatever. So truly, here's my break even. It's about $350,000. So how much do you feel is fair for me to make? To do all this work, to take on this risk, how much do you feel is fair for me to make? I don't know, Keith, you tell me. You're the investor, you're the professional. Well, Sandra, I, I, I really don't have a price in mind. Honestly, I'm a terrible negotiator. <laughs> We're not gonna do business unless you're okay with giving up some of this equity. And I'm not gonna do business unless I'm okay making that amount. She said $40,000. <laughs> I said, Sandy, you're out of your mind. There's $40,000 that needs to go into this. I have to make more money than what I'm putting into this because I'm not only doing the $40,000 of renovation, but I'm buying the whole unit. I have to pay interest. My lenders, $40,000 is just not, I have too many deals going on right now to be doing this amount of work for $40,000. Keith, what if you made, what if you made 80,000? Remember how I told you? They need to hear your sigh of disgust. They need to see your brow furrow. They need, when, you're, when you're in person, it's really easy to convey these messages. When you're on the other side of the microphone, you have to, I don't know, you have to enunciate. You have to be a little bit bigger with your emotions and such. And, um, but we are across the table, $80,000. I want you to think about this. That is a lot of money to somebody who is relatively new in investing, who's young, I'm newly married. I have two little babies at home. That is life-changing money. But my mentor, you will not get excited over the money. You will not. I cracked a little bit of a smile that I had to cover up. $80,000. Mm. Ryan's laughing. I have the bearing of a Marine. Like I, you... Once I've made up my mind that I'm not going to smile, I will not smile. I just think about morbid thoughts. That's what I would do. $80,000 just sitting on the other side of the table. All I have to do is sign this paper. No way. 
Sandy, I have so many projects going on right now. I'm really, really sorry. And if you end up not wanting to do business with me, I would totally understand. I simply cannot say yes to that amount of work. There is, this is a humongous undertaking. Anything could go wrong. And if it goes wrong, I'm not making 80,000 anymore, guaranteed. One mistake, one contractor screws me. One thing doesn't get here in time. I hold it for one month longer, $10,000. Each one of those mistakes is at least a $10,000 mistake. I simply can't take the risk. I remember her saying, she put both of her hands on the table like this. Keith, could you please buy my house if you made $100,000? You know how cool that is to have somebody say something like that to you on the other side of a table? She put her hands on the table and she's begging me to make $100,000 on this house. I cannot smile. I cannot get excited. I said, Sandy, I'm not saying that I can, but if I could get you, let's reverse engineer this. So this means your mortgage is a hundred thousand. I'd be taking up a hundred. So this means you're walking away with 240. No, 140. I did my math wrong. It's 140 is what she walked away with. I'm not saying that I can, but if I could get you $140,000 cash at close, you said you wanted about a month to move out. I buy an as is condition. You don't have to touch that godforsaken piece of crap anymore. She had tried to renovate it, by the way. She stuck her whole life savings into this thing. And she said, yeah, I would sell you the house. I flipped my paper around and I said, sign, initial, date. I never gave an offer. I never beat her up over price. We made $120,000 on my first in-person retail, full retail flip. So that's how we, we negotiate. I wanna share one more thing. Ryan, if you, I always get so carried away, bro. Do you wanna just drop off? I know that you have a meeting to go to. And then I- um, No, it's, I have some other things I have to do, so. Um, but yeah, it was great. I have other questions I wanna ask and we just didn't have enough time, you know? And oh I know goodness. I know everybody else does too, right? I have another story and everything. And you've got another story. Can Dang we it. do this again next yeah, week? Yeah, we should do a part Let's two. Let's do, yeah, part two on negotiation because there's there's a lot. I think the one of the other things is, and I was mm -hmm. talking to one of our newer clients, uh, Sharon, who, you know, she was saying how she's getting, you know, these sellers who are like, I want full real retail or whatever. And I'm like, well, how do you handle that? Because that's, I mean, and you kind of got into it a little bit, but I feel like, and this is my idea, and you don't need to respond to me now, but and you can share next week even, that a lot of it has to do with that initial, the initial questions about repairs, about mortgage, about uh, motivation, all of that then comes into play where you say, well, you know, you're never going to get that price because you've got fifty thousand dollars in repairs you need to make yeah, yeah, in order yeah. to bring it up to oh, that. I so love, that, you know, so I all of that. I think there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, because I think there's a lot of sellers who, um, you ask them for their number and they give a very unrealistic number, right? Um, they're like, I want a million dollars for my house. Like, yeah. Okay, well that's never going to happen. Let's let's get real. And then what are the tools that you use? to then bring them back to reality. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming a lot of that has to do with the things that you already asked um, yes. in order to get to know about their property. So um, I think in part two, I want, uh, yeah, I want we'll us go to go deep. through that. Yes. Um, and then I think uh, Padgy had a question, but John looks like you answered the deficient about the deficient deficiency judgment. Um, I believe what was that called that he has to pay taxes yeah. on deficiency judgment. Deficiency judgment. And then Is that correct? Pat, you also asked, did I do a novation? No, I didn't. I took title to that house. I raised the, I raised the private money for that house. We did the renovation. I was fresh. No, I wasn't even on the Marine Corps yet. Uh, this was uh, like COVID had, had happened as soon as I bought the house. And um, so we were all grounded and it was such a huge blessing in disguise. Uh, and it really gave me a, a great, it was the first house I ever renovated 100% by myself. Prior to that, I had partners who were in construction and stuff like this. 
but um but that was my first retail flip yeah exactly dude cool man yeah the other thing i wanted to say was um just to everybody you know it's a little plug for uh, our new course deal structure dictionary and actually i'm going to give you a link and it's in here if you're not a client yet we sell not just that course but also our triage call and perfect presentation scripts on the next page after you buy the deal structure dictionary and we offer it at a very low price compared to what it normally is so if you need those scripts plus you know deal structure education and then we also offer some other stuff in you know through that uh funnel that and everything's discounted uh quite a bit um, then, then go there and check it out. And if, and if you feel like that's something that you need right now, that's going to help you, uh, it definitely will, especially if you're struggling with negotiation, knowing deal structure and strategy, um, because you got to begin with the end in mind. <laughs> you need to know where you're taking the deal um, before you get on the phone with somebody. And then the scripts themselves, uh, really everything that Keith taught today, like things to sell and how to do it, a lot of that's built into our dynamic scripts that you get with the course. So you get access to those scripts um, in, inside of the course actually. And uh, it's all it's all dynamic. So it's pretty cool stuff. And we'll share more about that next week. But I just put the link in the chat uh, um, and I'll share it uh, in f the Facebook group as well. All right. Thank you guys. I, I'm going to bounce out. Keith's going to finish <laughs> out though. If I, it's up to him how he does it. All right. No, thank I you everybody. We're... See ya. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're good? See you soon, Ryan. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've got nothing else. If we, if we have a question, so go ahead, Ryan, uh, we'll handle, we'll field a couple of questions and then we'll turn in for the evening. If you have a question, go ahead. Don't even raise your hand. Just, uh, just turn your video on, come off mute. And, um, this is open forum as I promised. Any questions at all here to answer. There's only one way to Hey, Keith. Hey, Keith. Yes, sir. Um, so I, uh, my dream, my goal is to do, uh, nationwide, um, to get a website built that somehow hits in every state and every area and literally have the most AdWords, like in the world, most keywords or whatever. Um, how hard is that coming from like an SEO and then eventually a PPC standpoint. What do you what do you think about that? Do you know anyone that's attempted it? Well, um, yeah, there's a couple of people. I actually have a really good friend uh, who has nearly dedicated his entire adult life to becoming uh, the biggest SEO website nationwide. It is extremely both difficult and expensive. Like if you don't know how to do this yourself, we're talking multi millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, putting putting in because think about it, you are competing, dude. You're competing against. Just think about hedge funds. Just think about every big broker in, in in one area. You're not competing against just one area, dude. You are competing against every broker, every realtor, every investor, every hedge fund, every property management group, every freaking everything. They're all up against you if you go the SEO route. I would strongly recommend not going the SEO route. That is a freaking pipe dream fantasy that is, I don't believe, realistic. Um, unless you have a lot more money than than I think you do. <laughs> yep. um, no disrespect. Um, yep. it's, just, it's just not um, not typically feasible for for the average Joe. Um, but SEO, I mean, but PPC, it's actually easier. It is easier. It is cheaper. It is more scalable to go multi-metro than it is one metro. Meaning your cost yeah. per lead in one metro, dude, think about San Francisco, one of the, or even uh, Phoenix, Arizona. My God, you can spend $400, $500, $600 for a lead. One lead. I get properties under contract for cheaper than that. And you will have to buy one lead. My cost per lead is 46 bucks. And you will be paying $400, $500, $600 for a lead. This is not good in some, in some metros, right? In other metros, if you were to go to Dallas, Texas, for example, you're going to pay $300 for a lead. If we were to go to Washington, D.C., it would be 
mm, well, arguably about three hundred dollars. Maybe maybe Alexandria two hundred two hundred and fifty dollars uh, cost per leaf. If you're to go to like Podunk, Idaho, now we're dropping it down to a hundred dollars per leaf or something like this. But the moment you go multi metro, you can get numbers like. $46 cost per lead or $58 cost per lead. I've got my numbers all the way down to 35 before. And they're still um, retaining really good quality. Why? Because Google is actually going to encourage you. It's going to benefit you. It's going to um, uh, reward you for spreading yourself thin because it's inconvenient to do this, right? It's more difficult. There's more logistics. As long as you have a process, we have a process. Uh, we just put two... Well, how many did I say? Four properties under contract this uh, this month. And I don't even know where, where they are. I probably should since we're selling them all next week. Um, I think two of them are in Texas. One of them is in Michigan. And one of them is in Louisiana. Um, so we're all over, dude. It does add a level of complexity, but that's why we have such insanely detailed checklists of here's how to, for, for example, you need to solidify your, what is the valuation of the home? What is this house worth? Well, how are we gonna do that? Through CMAs. How are we gonna get the CMAs? By doing following this process. Specifically, this is what we're looking for in a realtor and specifically, this is what we're looking for in our CMAs, both ARV as well as as is value. After you've verified your value, now you need to verify your repairs. How do we do repairs? Well, we're gonna start off with just pictures from the seller because we don't want to go blow $400 on a full, you know, a home inspection. If they send you pictures and it's like, dude, this is not at all what you described. So we have, we have really, really good processes that are dialed in to make this easier when you're scaling at, you know, I, I started with 380, 360 or 380 metropolitan cities across the United States. And it's insanely cheap to do that. You can have wow. a budget of fifteen hundred dollars per month, and you'll crush it. Wow, that's awesome! Thank yeah, you. Man. Yeah, dude. Any follow-on questions there? Uh, no. Okay. Not yet. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, man, Miss Billy. Hey, Keith. So, like, just tapping into all of this, and um, like, I just kind of like Facebook, like off market. Um, you know, in San Diego region, off market in Seattle region, and things like that. And, you know, I'm getting a lot of other um, property acquisition or wholesalers that are like, oh, I got a list of properties. We're looking for buyers. Um, do you utilize those? And how do you tap into that where you're almost not paying for leads? They're almost coming to you. Um, what would be the process and how do you recommend going about that? Well, I don't. I don't know if I would recommend going about that. The only reason why, <laughs> here's the thing, you're going to have to pay an equal amount for every lead. What I just said is absolutely crazy. I want you to think about what I just said. You're going to have to pay an equal amount for every lead. Sometimes okay. you're going to pay in money and sometimes mm -hmm. you're going to pay in time. Okay. And so it may be insanely cheap, but mm -hmm. you're going to waste a lot of time sifting through this list of absolutely garbage leads that have no motivation. Mm -hmm. There's zero spread. They're upside down, negative equity, horrible cash, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and you're like, oh, but these are free leads. That's right. Well, mm -hmm. I, I value my time more than I value money. And so I am picky. I am snooty. I am <laughs> lazy. I am spoiled, whatever you want to call it. But I would mm -hmm. rather pay a lot of money for high quality leads, only talk to eight or 10 or 12 of them to put a property under contract over scrubbing a list of 100 that it takes me 10 minutes to analyze each deal or deal, <laughs> each, <laughs> each property. Mm -hmm. And I just spent a thousand minutes to finally find one where the numbers may or may not work. And then I reach out to them. Oh, sorry. We already had somebody call us. They we're under contract with another investor. Oh mm -hmm. my goodness. I hate that. You know? Okay, awesome. It's so it really depends on your, but listen, some people, they need to go that route because they don't have a dime, you know, that they have $300 yeah. to their name. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Then PPC is not your, you should not do PPC. Bracket at that or... point. Now I'm going to direct mm -hmm. them to something like what you're talking about, scrubbing Facebook, scrubbing Craigslist, scrubbing mm -hmm. uh, for sale by owner or Zillow or something mm -hmm. like that. Great way. One of, one of my best friends actually just put a property under contract near me. 
Um, <laughs> he he literally called three people on Zillow for sale by owner listed Ooh. more than 90 days. He made this guy, <laughs> um, he didn't make him an offer, but hopefully you understand. He took him to, through the perfect presentation <laughs> and uh, turned it into a, a killer, killer <laughs> owner <laughs> finance deal. That's good. And Wonderful. put the property under contract. Third person okay. that he called. Wow. That's exciting. Yeah, it is. Okay. Awesome. Just wondering. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. All right. John, Sean, Israel, Raj, iPhone, Kimo, and Poopa Bears. Any other questions? Open forum. You can ask me any questions if you want. I had a question, Keith. It's not really for me. It's just uh, something that I thought of um, in hearing you talk. It was a, um, so it's kind of like you talk about you being the prize. So like when you talk about from a lead generation perspective and the people calling in, I'm the prize and having that, like that attitude. Mm -hmm. And then same thing when you're going through the negotiation and like you told the story about how the lady wanted you to take the house for 80,000 and you know, you said no, and you said no. So like I said, this isn't necessarily for me. I've been doing it long enough in acquisitions. You call it commission breath. Uh, there's other things called like house horny. And it's like this idea that when you're newer and maybe you don't have a lot of leads, you don't have a lot of deals, you can fall into this trap where you feel like you need to force something to happen yeah. just because you don't have that track record. You don't have all these leads. You don't know that you're, that you have the the, the ability to do it. So how is a newer person going to fake it till they make it let's say you know like be able to have that attitude out of the gate so that they're not chasing deals but they're letting the deals kind of come to them john you have just asked me the hardest question that i've been asked all that's the that's the goal right i like to put you in the ringer i don't i don't know if i have a, a good or qualified or respectable answer for this because um, that was me in that deal. That was the most money I had ever made. That was my very first like big hit, like slam dunk. Took me three years to get it. I had put properties under contract before. I don't know if you know this, but my very first property was slated to make over six figures. And I, I just, I screwed up everything that I possibly could have screwed up. And I literally walked away with a check for $2,000 Two. I went from over a hundred to two. Wow. And and I hadn't really gotten into my group 2016, 2017, 2018, just struggle, struggle, struggle. And uh, I didn't really have that many properties put under contract when I'm telling the story regarding the 2019 house. But I was really scared of doing, this was a complete gut. There was no walls. There was no flooring. They, they needed to rough in plumbing and, and reroute things and tear down walls. There was nothing in this house. And I had never actually done a renovation. I had done renovate. I had been part of renovations, but my partner at the time had done them. It wasn't Brandon. It was prior to me even knowing Brandon. My partner at the time was the one who was very experienced at doing renovations. And she, she crushed it. She always, she was just really knowledgeable. And so this is the first one that I was going to be doing solo. And I was scared to death. And I really didn't want to, to do this. And for four years, I had been making the excuse of, I'm active duty in the Marine Corps. I can't be raising all this private money to take houses down. I can't be hiring contractors and managing them and the change orders and blah, 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 creating the scopes of work. I had been telling myself this, this excuse. And here I am. I got basically one year before I'm leaving the Marine Corps, I have more time than I've ever had in my life. I don't have an excuse anymore. And I used that in that moment to say, I don't really want this house, but I'll do it if I'm gonna make a killing on it. I will learn all of this stuff that I need to learn. And I need to build in, because I had seen $100,000 go to $2,000, just one, just two years prior, I had seen $100,000 go to $2,000. And I saw how quickly these mistakes add up. $12,000 here, $15,000 here, $28,000 here. Stupid stuff like soil density. Who even knows about soil density? Like I didn't even know that was a thing 
that's a thing for the worms. Like, I don't understand any of this stuff. But then you basically get a degree in structural engineering whenever you're popping the top to a house and building a second story. You actually care about this. I was completely unprepared. And so I knew that I needed to build in a lot of equity into this house to cover for my mistakes. And truth be told, I, I really didn't make any mistakes on that house. Like, I thought I was going to make 100. I actually made 120. I did a fair, fairly good job. And I, I don't think that I have an answer to your question. Uh, I just did it. I, I wouldn't say that I was faking it um, of like, I'm, I'm posturing or I'm posing or I'm whatever. I legitimately was scared to do this huge renovation. And I, I knew that I didn't have the money if things went south, I didn't have the money in reserves. There had to be enough built in that I could not fail. It had to be impossible for me to fail before I would do the deal. So I, I don't think that I was faking it till I'm making it. I had some legitimate fears going into the deal. Yeah. And everybody, everybody else, I, I don't think that they're going to be in that situation. I don't think they're going to have my, my past or my history. And I hate to say it, but I don't really think I have any advice or anything worthwhile uh, to say to, to somebody else or in their circumstance. That's just where I was in that season. Mm -hmm. Terrible advice. I'm sorry. That totally doesn't answer the question. Failed that question. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I'm watching your PML uh, course and you're wearing the same shirt in the video. I have you on the other screen and you're wearing that's that exact so shirt in the video. So. Have you seen me put my hat on yet? Yep. That's the video I just watched. Oh, that's so funny. Yeah. That's so funny. All right. What would you say, by the way, if you were, if you had somebody ask you the same question? Um, I think for me, a lot of it was like, and what I've told, you know, like I told it to Glenn is like, you don't necessarily have to be the one who knows everything and, and be the one that feels that confident, like he, he's got me behind him. And so kind of the idea is like, if you're in a group like this, or you're in Facebook, or you're in a mastermind or whatever, you don't have to be the expert and you don't have to be the one that's, yeah. you don't have to be confident off of your own ability. You can be confident off of the fact that you have a, a bunch of people around you who know what they're doing. It's that, that idea of surrounding yourself with, you know, with people that you want to be like, you know, like, yeah. you know, like that, that kind of person. So um, I used to say that a lot to like the acquisitions people that I trained for the company that I used to work for is like, yeah. they'd be like, Oh, well, I don't know acquisitions like you. And I'm like, yeah, but I do. And yeah. you have access to me. So it doesn't really matter. So you can go in there with confidence because if you get stuck, you can just excuse yourself and get on the phone and call me or yeah. call, call yeah. Joe or whatever. I love and, that. You know, yeah. so that's what I've told Will as well. Will, um, has never had, Will is our acquisition manager, never had a sales position before. Right. Uh, always customer service, customer service and sales, polar opposite. It's actually having a customer service um, mouth in a, in a sales position is terrible. We are not there to, to please. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, gosh, he was so fearful. He was so scared. And I kind of said something similar. I told him, Will, you cannot put me in a position that I cannot get out of. Yeah. It's impossible for you to screw this up. Our contract is ironclad, tested by so many attorneys over so many years. Yep. I can get out of it. So put the property under contract. If you royally screwed up, I will call the seller myself. I will profusely apologize for wasting their time. I don't mean to lead you on. It was my fault. I didn't train him. He missed this one thing. It was a horrible mistake. If you don't want to do business with us, I will send you a release this evening. There's no big deal. There's no big deal at all. Just put it under contract. I'll look mm -hmm. it when you're done. Yeah. Now the dude, holy smokes. I can't get him to. Sometimes, yeah, man. Sometimes yeah. I'm like, you put that under contract. Like, I don't even want this. You told me you can get out of it. I know, I know. And then we, and then, then we end up wholesaling. It's crazy. I was like, <laughs> somebody bought this piece of crap. That was a terrible price. All right. Hey, look at this. We've got some new. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah. We had Mr. iPhone here. All right. Pat, Sean, Billy, Raj, Poopa Bears, iPhone 15 Pro Max. You guys have any, any other questions before we close down for the evening? I have a mental countdown in my head from 10. We're at six right now. Now we're at three. All right. 
Y'all have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful evening. Enjoy your week. Part two, I guess. Part two. Do you even negotiate coming next Thursday, 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time? Be there or be square. I promise you'll get something valuable out of it. Y'all have a wonderful night. Talk to you soon.